the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have we have quite a number of ways that we assist producers in marketing. We have some international marketing, some domestic marketing. Then we have some really specialized areas too. And one in particular is the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program, and that's a federal grant program that we administer. And that's really about emerging markets and trying to develop those emerging markets and industries. And so these are more examples of uh, Willow Mo Mountain Winery. We work with the Grape and Wine Growers Association. We work with the Cider Association in an effort to try to grow those industries. Those are um, maybe industries that aren't typically considered conventional to Montana, but they certainly have a lot of uh, potential. The other program that we operate is called Growth Through Agriculture, and that is a program that's funded through the Montana Coal Money, and, it's, and that's uh, particular to the state of Montana. I, I don't know that any other states have a program like this, and it's a grant program as well as a loan program, and it's designed to assist uh, producers or business owners in uh, any sort of entrepreneurial um, ideas that they have and through a grant or a loan we can help them get those ideas off the ground. It's, uh, it's a maximum of a $50,000 grant or a up to a $100,000 loan and that's an annual grant cycle. And these are some examples of some of the projects that have been funded. Um, some really neat ideas. There's uh, the cherries out of the flathead. Those are a little bit of an unusual egg crop that we don't think too much about. The cherry juice, very unique. I'm not sure that you can find this product probably any other place except the state of Montana. And they've uh, developed it. They've used um, cold cherries, which is a nice, nice thing to have for that. And uh, Gluten-Free Prairie, they're located in the Gallatin Valley. You guys are probably familiar with them. And they offer uh, gluten-free uh, brownie mix. They also have this uh, Gut Buster cookie. And, <laughs> and it's an awesome cookie, gluten-free. And they do it with oats. Um, I think you've had Bob Quinn on the show recently. Mm -hmm. And this is that product that they make, which is Cracklin Kamut, which is the ancient grains, kind of a a fried wheat, uh, very popular. And then uh, the crickets, uh, <laughs> which I, I'm going to invite you all to go ahead and sample. We have oh, open, I see you have it open. We have no it open. We have no excuses, except uh -huh. Jane's afraid they're going to get caught in her teeth. Uh, <laughs> Lori's going to want to eat those. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, Lori's got cool stuff, but we're not going to eat Lori's stuff. Um, yeah, and then also, is a cricket, a chocolate chirp cookie. I don't see it up here. Um, so those are all examples. And this is one of my favorites. This is Farber Farms. And this is, Shauna Farber is a farmer in Scobie. And she wanted to find a way to add value to her products. And so she started making mixes. And she makes some fabulous soup mixes and some brownie mixes where she uses her own wheat and her own lentils and, and really fantastic. And this is her latest product and it's called Lentil Crunchers. And these you can put on salad or you can just eat them straight, but they're basically just fried lentils and they are very good. This one is a little bit unusual. This is a guy uh, who's a alfalfa uh, farmer and he was struggling to get off of uh, tobacco. And so he developed an alternative to tobacco using alfalfa. So anyway, um, I'll get some of those out of the way, but but that's some of the projects that we've done. There's a, there's a lot more. GTA has been around since 1987, so you can imagine the multitude of projects that have been funded. Uh, it's an annual grant cycle. It's pretty competitive. There's usually a lot more applicants than we have funding for, but Montanans are so full of good ideas, and it's just so fun to hear what they come up with. And some of the projects that we funded have been more traditional. Strix Ag is an example of that, helping them expand their processing center and, and actually grew that to add 26 additional employees. And so sometimes people need a little help, sometimes they need more help, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a way that Montana actually puts their money to use for um, to help these guys add value to their products. Well, thank you, Christy. And hopefully some of these projects will result in interesting stories that maybe other people will get to tell on this show in the future. Yes. So, so uh, Jane, we've got a question from Billings. Um, they have scotch thistle in their pasture and it's spreading into their vegetable garden. How can you control scotch thistle? Uh, yeah, so scotch thistle is a biennial. 
so the trick there is, uh, I mean, you can sever the root of that plant. It's, it has a pretty uh, stout tap root. So, you know, a, a spade or a shovel and just, especially in the, the garden setting that it sounds like they're seeing it, just use that spade or shovel and um, poke down into the ground and, and break that root off. If, if they do have plants that are flowering or, you know, they miss some uh, uh, now and they see them flowering later, just cut the tops of the plants off and keep those from producing seed. In the pasture setting, there are uh, several herbicides that work really well on thistles. Um, so that would be an option as well in the pasture setting. Okay, great, thank you. So Christy, back to you really mm -hmm. quickly. I guess one of the things that comes to mind, um, who decides who gets funded? So the funding, once the grants are all gathered up and that's the deadline to apply for a grant or loan is November 1st, there is a board, it's called the Ag Development Council and that's a board that is appointed by Governor Bullock and they're the ones that decide. They spend, last year they spent two full days with um, just reviewing applications and having the producers actually come in and provide their ideas in person. And so then that, that panel decides uh, who gets funding. And, it, and last year we had probably three times the amount of applicants that we did for funding. So it's a difficult decision and it's a long couple of days. But it, it's really fun to, to listen to all those great ideas. Yeah, I'm sure it's very inspirational. So, uh, Lori, a question came in from Missoula. Um, this person has mountain ash trees and insect boreholes in the trunk which run parallel. What are the insects and how should the trees be treated? Uh, if they're running parallel, I, I would suspect maybe that they're, uh, it could be sapsucker damage and they're woodpeckers and they're actually not going after the, the insects at all. Uh, they're, they're going after the sap in the tree. So uh, if, especially if they're, if they're lining the entire tree, they, they look like, it almost looks like a drum, if, if that's kind of what it looks like. But, uh, and they're protected, so you have to use, a, the best thing to do would be to use a flashy tape or some sort of, you could even put old CDs, get rid of your old CDs that way. <laughs> <laughs> something or spoons or something to, mm -hmm. to deter them. And, and you might not be seeing them at their feeding, but that's what, probably what that is. So, Lori, you said it, they're woodpeckers they're, yeah. and they're eating the sap, is that right? Yeah, or they're tapping what? into the tree and they're, they're going after the sap. And is that a, like an energy source for them? I know, I'm not expecting you to tell us what <laughs> birds eat. <laughs> yeah, is that, are they going after it as a, for the calories or? That's a good question. Okay. Yeah, I, right. I should know that. Yeah. <laughs> I so. I mean, if they're sucking sap, they would be probably getting into the phloem and... So is it really going to damage like the tree? Yeah. It will. I mean, my it my when I moved into my house, my pine tree was just completely covered. So eventually, it'll if it if it's the entire trunk, then yeah. But the tree will be fine otherwise. Okay. Yep. Okay. So a question for David from Kalispell, and this is very appropriate for David because he also works um, as a beekeeper and is a resource at MSU for that. Um, when should they spray for worms and fruit trees that are near beehives? And then also what products can you use that are safe for bees? Okay, so Lori and I, we're gonna, we'll tag team on this <laughs> yeah. I just volunteered you. <laughs> so we need to know what the, the pest is. And so a lot of apple people are concerned now because coddling moths are just now being reported across the state when you say, two weeks ago in Missoula and Hamilton, and we caught a codling moth in a trap at the orchard at the Hort Farm yesterday or Friday. And so um, you won't spray those trees while they're in bloom, mm. you know, because uh, it's the adult moths are showing up and then they'll mate and lay eggs and it's the eggs when they hatch into the larvae that actually burrow into the fruit. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as beehives, bees don't fly at night. And uh, so if you can spray it late in the day after they've gone back to the hive or very early in the morning before they really have gotten out, um, the product label will say whether or not it's toxic to bees. Many compounds are. They're fairly um, susceptible to a broad range. Um, if the BT products are appropriate, so the Bacillus thuringiensis for a lot of the Lepidoptera and the caterpillar pests, um, I don't think that has a whole lot of efficacy. Uh, impact on bees. Um, 
So and maybe Spinoza too. If Spinoza is a choice, if if BT is not, BT is 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 the best option, but it's it's hard to get good coverage. So so is Spinoza not toxic to bees? It is it is toxic, but it's not as toxic as as a lot of the other options. So it is important to look at the label. And now you look at the environmental hazard on the label, and it'll tell you. That's where you'll find the bee information on there, and, and most of them are, are required to have that on there. Okay. Now, if, if they're your beehives or it's your neighbor's beehives, if you let them know, they might either A, move them, or you can actually purchase a screen, uh, like a net, like a big covering over that beehive, and then just keep them in for the day. And then that way, because once the pesticide is dry, then the uh, the impact on the bees is, is greatly reduced. Oh, okay, good. So a question for Jane from Kalispell, um, and I'm interested in this one. How do you keep quack grass out of your asparagus beds? Are you mm -hmm. saying you have quack grass <laughs> as well, <laughs> Dinah? <laughs> How do you get rid of quack grass on asparagus bed? You're just pulling it. I mean, you're just repeatedly pulling. You could uh, wipe glyphosate Mm -hmm. on those leaves. Um, I've heard people say that, you know, they use a, a latex glove or some sort of glove that is appropriate to use with Roundup and just dip their fingers in it and just run up the leaf, you know, mm -hmm. pull their fingers up the, the leaf or you can use, you know, a rag or something like that. But you need to be very careful about keeping that Roundup from getting on anything else. But, you know, quack grass, it's just it's just repeated pulling and it's a constant battle. Is there a time of year that the herbicide would be more effective? Is it like thistle and bindweed in the fall after they've had frost, do they move you know, material back? I, I think probably now would be the best time to treat okay. quack grass because it seems to me like at least what I see in my own yard, <laughs> it's, actively growing the most now. I think, you know, more towards the end of the summer when it's hotter and drier and the, the grass tends to kind of go more dormant. Um, but I think now would be a good time. It's also a good time to pull because we still have some soil moisture and the soil's a little bit mm -hmm. soft. So, but I mean, it, it is, it's just a constant, yeah. a constant maintenance. So thing. one thing that I've been wondering about, I know there is a grass herbicide. It's the active ingredient is like, Clothinidin or there's a uh, clethidin, cefoxidin. Uh, yeah. There's several grass-specific herbicides. But with asparagus, I I don't know if is, this, is, is asparagus, asparagus a monocot. I don't I'm not know. actually even really sure, David, the I'd horticulturist. To... <laughs> well, I'm trying to think if it is because uh, the it has such a fern like. It doesn't flower like a monocot. No, yeah. it doesn't. So maybe. I'm getting a nod from another horticulturist over at the phone bank that's saying, yeah, it is a monocot. It is. <laughs> oh, it is a monocot, okay. <laughs> yeah, don't use a grass-specific herbicide then. Yeah, and okay. I have sprayed quack grass with a grass-specific herbicide, and it is just hard to kill. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, even with that, you're looking at multiple applications. Yeah, it's a, it's a I, tough one. I would, you know, combine, you know, pulling spraying if you can, but I'd probably limit that to Roundup or, you know, glyphosate mm -hmm. product. Carefully. And yeah, just mm -hmm. doing all, you know, on. trying it all. Okay. Um, Christy, um, this is a question that came in from Billings and they're one, evidently they've been through this process before and are wondering about how you can get help for filling out applications. So there's a couple of, obviously our website has a lot of information and it does, there is a webinar and there is staff available in our office. But uh, for economic development groups, there's the food and ag development centers and there's one located in Joliet. There's one located in Haver, there's one in Ronan and there's one in Great Falls. And those are economic development centers that are really focused on assisting uh, agricultural uh, development and they can help with they can really it's they're a really good resource too if you are struggling with even if you have filled out an app a grant application before they can really help you focus what uh, what the GTA board is looking at there's criteria mm -hmm. that um, that you may that maybe isn't obvious but the food and ag development centers can really help walk you through 
Okay. I have a follow-up question for sure. Christy. Is the application fully online? It is. Okay. Yes, it is. And you can go to our website and find that application. And then if someone doesn't get funded, do they get feedback on their proposal so that they can revise it and improve it for they do. the next year? They do. Okay. And, and it's not that uncommon to go through a couple of grant cycles. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first time, you know, they maybe not, aren't ready, um, maybe their financial statements aren't fully developed, um, or they just need a little bit more time to develop that idea. Mm -hmm. And so it's not uncommon to, to sometimes have to go through a couple of grant cycles. And, and like I said, it's pretty competitive. Okay. Thank you, Christy. So here's another Lori and Dave question, mm -hmm. but I think it's a really good one from Moccasin. Um, these folks live in a farm house and they have um, swarming bees that are making a home in the eaves of their metal roof in their home. So first of all, they're wondering if these bees can be relocated. Are they beneficial? And then if they're not beneficial, should they be relo relocated or eliminated? So there's a little bit to chew on there, but, uh, but what do you do if you, if you get them invading your roof? I suspect that they're wasps. So yeah, I, I, uh, I, I one couple of years ago when I moved into my house, I thought that I had honeybees moving into my eaves and, and then I, I got binoculars out and they didn't have any hair on them. So, <laughs> so they were wasps. The bees <laughs> yeah. are hairy. Bees are hairy, yep. And, and honeybees coming into the house is, is kind of kind of rare. I mean, you've, uh, you've probably- Oh, it happens though. It does they happen. They get into buildings and it's, it's a, can be a huge mess. Yeah, when we had our farm in Billings, we had an old granary that we used as a storage shed and they got into like the floor joists of that old building and it was right by the door and they would colonize and we had a truck farm and we had people that would get stung by the honeybees uh, uh, uh. and we had we had a beekeeper and we had bees you know on the farm and um, it was just kind of a I guess a a, a side product of, <laughs> of having the bees around to yeah. pollinate our crops. <laughs> If they are bees, though, it is, it's tricky to, to, to get them out of the house. So, mm -hmm. um, but well, don't you have to get the queen? You have or to get the queen. And you have to get all the wax and honey, honey. that they've left behind, because that'll just act as an attractant uh, for yeah. the next. And you think about, oh, if I just get the colony out, like, oh, I'll spray it and I'll kill all the bees. Well, then the bees aren't keeping the wax below the temperature in which it will melt, because they're mm -hmm. not in there actively cooling it, so then the honey will start to liquefy and run out and then you have that coming into your house. Oh yeah, so you got to get it all out. Okay. But you're, Lori's right. First make sure A, if they're bees or wasps. If they're wasps then... Wasps are tricky. It could either be the, the uh, western yellow jacket or it could be the European paper wasp. And European paper wasps uh, really like the, like the eaves of the house. So maybe it's a good time to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, I think you've got a show and tell there where you what can talk segue. about that. What a segue. What a segue. Yeah, really. Yes, I did. I, I was uh, out reading this morning on my porch and I noticed that there were quite a few European paper wasps trying to, uh, they're, they're making nests underneath my, underneath my deck. And they actually don't wrap their nests with, with uh, any pulp, so they're kind of open. Uh, but they, they look like they I always say they look like they have frog legs. They're kind of hanging down and the legs are hanging on and they, um, they really are, are, their sting's supposed to be pretty, pretty bad, but they uh, try to avoid being around humans. Uh, they don't seem to bother me at all. So uh, they actually <laughs> really like to be on, on the eaves and it's, it's hard to trap these guys. Uh, I think if you Google European paper wasp and Utah State, I think, I think Utah State has recommended a homemade trap. So that might be one way to trap them. Uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to bring today to show was this is the trap for uh, the other one that could be, if it's not, if they aren't bees and they're not hairy, are, is the uh, Western Yellow Jacket. In the Western Yellow Jacket, the queens, at least in Bozeman, uh, they could have been out um, earlier in several areas, but the queens are out, uh, they're fertilized and they're making nests or, or uh, looking for places to make nests. So these traps, uh, you put a, a chemical, and you could get these at a nursery or a hardware store, and the chemical is called heptyl butyrate, and it, and it traps the Western Yellow Jackets and uh, the German Yellow Jacket and the Common Yellow Jacket. It doesn't trap bees. And this is the best way to take care of Western yellow jackets because uh, as the summer goes on, the nests get really large. You don't know where they are because they're usually subterranean. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and by the end of the summer when they're visiting your porch, they're really annoying, but they're um, the the nest is too large. So try to trap uh, get one of these out right now, and try to trap the queens. So, Lori, yes, like the paper wasp in this yellow uh, yellow jacket, do they pollinate? Like, are they beneficial insects for in terms of <laughs> pollinators? They're beneficial, more beneficial in, in, in the way that they, um, they're, they're uh, slightly predatory. I mean, they, they will feed oh. on, on some pest insects. Um, they're very, I think they do some, I, I've seen Western yellow jackets on my Cotone aster, but mm -hmm. they're, I mean, they're, they're not supposed to be important pollinators. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, David, this one's just for you. Um, <laughs> from Missoula, what's the best way to prune and what's the best timing for pruning apple trees with, lo with lots of new growth that's going straight up? Okay, so the best time to prune your trees is late winter before the sap really starts to get mm -hmm. flowing and probably broken bud. So um, right. I'd definitely avoid pruning them now just because of all the moisture that's available and the sap's going. and I think there's a Mont guide on pruning fruit trees, and so I would recommend you get online to MSU Extension and look at the fruit tree in Montana Mount guide, and it'll give you some ideas on how to train that tree uh, so that you have an appropriate leader and you don't have um, weak branching develop. Okay, great, thank you. So Jane, a question from Bozeman, and I think this is something that's on everybody Betty's mind right now, and that's dandelions. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's a few of those in there. There's a few of those, and they're showing themselves very well and beautifully mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. um, until they actually start to go to seed. Um, they have a large market garden and are fighting a lot of dandelions. Is there any effective organic method of controlling them? Not that I am aware of. Uh, I don't know if Dave has any input on that, but you know, a lot of times the organic folks tend to look at products like vinegar and, and things like that. They typically act as burn down herbicides right. in that they just burn the above ground plant tissue down to the ground. It, it's too late to do that in the Bozeman area anyway, mm -hmm. but um, they don't get to the root of a plant, so you know, the plant will grow back. But So the seeds that are being produced now, how long is, will it be before they germinate? I don't know. I've, I've never really read about the biology. Because the overwinter, as, it's a, as a rosette, it's a, yeah. is it a biennial as opposed to a per, perennial? So uh, I'm thinking if you might have more efficacy with these burn down products, killing the seedlings that are gonna produce flowers next year. Possibly, I yeah. think right now, at this point, you're pretty much limited to mowing. I would, I agree. Yeah. Right, mowing and digging. <laughs> yeah. and digging. You know, one, one thing beneficial about dandelions is they are, it is a pollinator. It does, there are pollinators visiting dandelions and it's early in the season. So they do provide a, a floral resource for pollinators before mm -hmm. a lot of other things are flowering. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you know, they, we kind of, it seems like every year we have this big flush of dandelions mm -hmm. and then they kind of go away and people don't think about them much until next, next year, year when the right. flush exactly. comes along. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, there are definitely a lot of them around this year. Um, so, Christy, um, this is a question from Lewistown. Okay, so you talked about how much um, a person could potentially get through a grant or, or a loan. Mm -hmm. um, how much total funding is available through the Coal Trust? Well, we grant out between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars a year, and the legislature did increase that a little bit this year, so we can see we'll see a uh, little bit of a an increase in the coming years. The um, it depends because it's based on. Part of the funding is based on the coal severance tax, so it depends. It's dependent upon the coal, um, the coal that's being harvested. So, okay. so the funding is a little bit. It's a little bit up in the air, but it, it's typically around four or five hundred thousand a year. Okay. So, is the growth through ag program tied in, or does it collaborate with? We have this design sandbox program going on. It's like. Bosch's potatoes, we're looking at how to develop a new product. And so 
It's a really interesting course because it, it pits a, a marketing person and a graphic artist and maybe somebody from finance and then um, uh, kind of nutrition slash food science. And so I know they worked with Pete Faye to come up with, I grow pumpkins, what can I do with, you know, other things besides jack-o'-lanterns. And so they were looking at pumpkin snacks and washed potatoes with one. And I just went, it was really fascinating. It is fascinating. I'm familiar with the program, and, and GTA isn't, isn't closely linked to it. I think specialty crop block grant is more closely linked to that. But it is a, it's a fascinating program because that's, I mean, that's the, the thing is we, we grow a lot of great agricultural products here but we tend to ship wheat and peas and beef across the border. And it would be really nice if, if we could develop those, but it does take, it takes somebody that's willing to study those. And Juan Yuen at the food lab here has been a fantastic resource too. Um, we stopped in and she was developing lentil crackers and um, uh, pasta made out of beans. And, and so there's, but it, it is time consuming. And it, it does take resources, too. And I think um, we didn't talk about it, but one of the things that our Bureau also manages are the checkoff dollars. And so when, when you sell your commodity, not all commodities have this, but there's checkoff money that goes into a fund, and, and the Department of Agriculture administers that fund. And again, we don't make those funding decisions. Those are made by the board in that industry. Mm -hmm. Nine is, uh, we worked with Nina a lot on the, the potato seed checkoff. Mm -hmm. And so every time they sell potato seed, a little bit of money goes into this account. And then this account uh, is dispersed through a grant process. People that have ideas would apply for it. And then uh, we um, manage the contracts and disperse those funds based on the board's decision. And so it, there's always opportunities like that too. Um, but I am a little bit familiar with that project and it is, it is really exciting and I think really kind of the cornerstone of what we need for innovation. We need to get you an invite to their final exam because you get to taste it all. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually that would be fun. It could be like a Master Chef, you can make a cooking there show out of that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that would be a really good show. <laughs> Chopped with Christy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, Lori from Bozeman, um, these folks recently had a pie cherry planted by a local nursery. It is covered with ants. First of all, why are they air there, and how do they get rid of them? Uh, they're probably chasing some some aphids mm -hmm. because the ants will protect the aphid. They'll grab the honeydew that the aphids excrete. And, um, and then they will take that back to their nest and then they, they literally will push away some of those ants, some of, their, some of the aphids' natural enemies and so they protect them. So if you've got ants, that's a sign you have aphids and, and um, there are a lot of products that you could use for, for aphids and any sort of contact insecticide. If you wanna keep it more on the organic side, you could do an insecticidal soap, mm -hmm. uh, but you might wanna test just a little bit of the leaves or something and make sure, or horticulture oil, and make sure that you don't have any phytotoxicity or burning in the leaves. Uh, so just don't apply it in direct sunlight or make sure the temperatures are cooler and follow the label, so. And make sure when the oil, it's horticulture oil and not dormant oil. Yes. yes that will really burn the leaves. dormant oil will yeah. really burn the leaves, so. For sure. <clears throat> And I'm thinking, is dormant oil maybe something that would you would use for a show and tell that you have? Dormant oil, this is, yeah, so this is, that is a, another wow, good segue. segue. Yeah. <laughs> Two in a row. I can't resist. <laughs> so for, uh, for a lot of people, this might just like, look like a normal branch, but it is just absolutely covered in pine needle scale. It's, you're not supposed to have any white specks in here, so it kind of looks like bird droppings. So I just got the sample in, um, I think it's from, the, from Highlight. Can't remember if some. Oh no, actually, this one is from Billings, and a uh, very heavy infestation of, of pine needle scale. And and actually, uh, in Bozeman, right now, the, uh, the 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 active stage of the pine needle scale is called the crawler stage, and it's associated with lilac bloom. And so lilacs are out right now, are blooming right now in Bozeman. Mm -hmm. So, um, but. Uh, but if so, you could you could apply a contact insecticide to take care of. This is really heavy. If we just have a few of these, it's not a big deal. But this is this is really heavy. Uh, you could apply the uh, uh, for the crawlers a contact spray. But 
it's usually the, one of the best things to do is a, is a dormant oil and mm -hmm. um, before bud break, and it's a little past that right now. So, so maybe a one-two punch. One-two punch when it's this heavy. Yeah, this uh -huh. is a tree that's really stressed. So all these pests that are coming in on, uh, for in situations like this, they're they're coming in on stressed trees. So this right. this tree actually had everything. It had uh, spruce bud scale. It had. Um, uh, Western spruce budworm. It had spider mites. So this is a tree that that's been that's old. And <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it needs more water. So right. Needs exactly. More water. And I, I remember when I was working in the diagnostic lab in drought years. You know, especially when you get a couple of them back to back, it seemed like you would get horrible scale and also situations where the trees would actually die. And it's like. It didn't necessarily die from the scale. It didn't necessarily die just from drought, but all but of those factors together. Can death by a thousand cuts. cuts. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the spider mites and everything <laughs> else that, that it could wow. potentially have. A tree needs love. <laughs> yes, it does. So, David, a question from Florence. Um, this gentleman has a 20 by 40 foot garden area that will, be n that will not be planted this year, so he's getting it ready for next year. What is the best way to control the weeds before they start growing next year? Rototilling, Roundup? So if, if the sod's gone and he has a garden plot and he's concerned about <clears throat> weeds coming in, um, you can take a couple different strategies, right? You could chem fallow, essentially, so a couple of applications of a broad spectrum herbicide would work. You have to be careful that you don't have, you don't use a product that has a long residual. You don't want it hanging around next year. And so I would be tempted to maybe do that um, early on in the season and then later in the season I would uh, switch to cultivation. So you don't want to rototill it multiple times because that's hard on the structure of the soil. Mm -hmm. Another um, strategy potentially is to uh, till it once and if you're not going to plant it this year you could put it into a cover crop. Oh. Sure. So mm -hmm. something like uh, cereal grains, you know, oats are pretty inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, get those established. Nature hates a vacuum, so if you leave 800 square feet of soil exposed, something's going to want to grow there. You might as well, you know, mm -hmm. uh, put a cover crop over it and then uh, mow the oats down before those seeds mature. And then in the spring, till that material in and it'll feed soil microbes and Lots of dandelion seeds floating around out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those right. Right. Yeah. That's right. Get those seeded for next year. <laughs> so um, a question for Jane from Hamilton. So um, it, it appears that they're trying to control their cheatgrass through mowing. Mm -hmm. And so with mowing and disposing carefully of, with, of the seeds, will the cheatgrass continue to grow and produce more seeds and more seeds after each mowing? You know, it kind of depends on uh, what stage the cheatgrass is at when it gets mowed. If it's, if it's developed most of its biomass and it's fully headed out and it, you come along and mow it, you've probably just taken a lot of that plant and depleted a lot of its energy. Uh, if, if you're continually mowing it, you know, every week or so, it's going to come back and grow just high enough to be under that mower the deck of the mower and probably produce some seeds. A lot of that also depends on what sort of soil moisture, like if we can, if we get precipitation. So if cheatgrass gets mowed off, it's going to try to grow back. But if, if it gets dry enough that there's just not soil moisture, there's nothing there for it to, you know, there's no water there for it to, to come back and seed. Um, so the, the trick with trying to mow cheatgrass to really stop seed production is to actually let it get, you know, this tall and be fully flowered, but not mm -hmm. have mature seeds on it. So right before it starts turning that reddish purple color, then come along and cut it. Cause it, it you just took a lot of the resources from that plant and it has a hard time growing mm -hmm. back. Is so. it very deep rooted? Not, not so much. I mean, when you grow it in the greenhouse, you, you know, you can get roots <laughs> a meter deep, but in the mm -hmm. field, you know, most of the roots are in that in that upper, probably six inches of okay. the soil. Um, yeah. So could I segue into a show and tell? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I forgot to segue to Jane. Excuse me. <laughs> I brought something that is very similar to cheatgrass. Uh, this is bulbous bluegrass, 
and um, it is, it's actually a perennial plant, but it, it behaves a lot like an annual, like, like cheatgrass. And it is fully headed out right now. It actually matures a little faster than cheatgrass does. It, um, I pulled this plant up and you can see that it hardly has any root material to it. Um, it earlier in the spring, it would have been just a little bunch of green leaves and then it shoots up these flowering stems. Uh, and this plant is interesting because it, it doesn't actually produce seed in North America where it's, it's not native to North America. And in, in North America, it produces these little bulblets instead of seeds. And those bulblets are, that's what's, you kind of see this purple color up here at the top of the plant. And the little hairy looking things are actually like little leaves coming out of those bulblets. They're actually like just miniature plants. Mm -hmm. um, and when they fall to the surface of the soil, you know, they don't have any dormancy. So uh, this, the same person that's probably calling about cheatgrass probably has some bulbous bluegrass around. There's a lot of it in the Bitterroot Valley. And this is an interesting plant because historically it's kind of hung out on the margins of, you know, disturbed areas and the edges of pastures. But we're seeing it now invade, you know, fairly intact native rangeland and, um, yeah, and pastures as well. So a lot of people don't know what it is. They're more familiar with cheatgrass, but you know, not as familiar with this bulbous bluegrass. So when those little bulblets fall, do they kind of root immediately? They can, yeah. They apparently don't have any dormancy. Like you know, a seed usually has some right. degree of dormancy, mm -hmm. but these bulblets, uh, reading the literature, I've never done any testing, but reading the literature, they say they're not, they don't have any dormancy. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, another one to look out for. So, <laughs> Christy, a question from Helena. Is hemp production and processing on the horizon for Montana? Hemp processing and production is very much on the rise in Montana. Um, and speaking of advisory committees, the, the hemp producers just petitioned the department to start their own hemp advisory uh, uh, committee because hemp is unusual in that it's been considered illegal for so long that there's not a lot of research done on it, but there's certainly a lot of interest in it. Mm -hmm. So we've seen um, a huge spike in hemp production. I believe we were the number one hemp producing state last year, and I think we'll probably be ahead of that again this year. We're seeing an enormous interest and, and lots of, you know, a huge variety of products that are coming um, in from fiber to food to um, CBD, uh, hemp extract oil, all those things. So with like the hemp extract oil and the CBD, is FDA involved at all in regulating the quality of those products or? We're waiting on FDA to, we, there was a, a whole day listening session from the federal government on Friday about what to do with CBD in particular. There are approved pharmaceutical uses, um, a couple of those. So it is used in some pharmaceutical products, uh, Epidiolex, mostly for treating juvenile uh, seizures. It's been really effective in that. Um, the rest of it, we're just waiting on the FDA to make a determination. Okay. So it'll be interesting to see it's how that develops. It's going to be very interesting, yes. 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 It's kept us busy. And and if anybody is interested in growing hemp, we did extend the deadline. It, it still requires licensing to grow in the state of Montana, and that uh, deadline is June 15th. So if you're interested in growing hemp, please get in touch with the department and get a hemp license. So if you grow it, is there processing in the state? There are a lot of companies that are interested in starting processing. There's a company, there was a, is a processing company um, up in the north, northwest corner of the state, but there's uh, some vertical integrated processing, I think, in place in Conrad. I'm not 100% sure they're up and running. There's a company in Fort Shaw. There's another one looking at great, I mean, they're just really popping up everywhere. Very fast, um, 